Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, episode 28, On the Outside, Looking In. We ended our last episode with John the Fearless being driven out of Paris in the aftermath of the Cabochia uprising and the Armagnacs taking his place. It's not entirely clear if the Duke of Burgundy had fled prematurely. I've seen arguments that if he had remained in Paris, he could have salvaged his position, but to do so came with its own risks. Furthermore, if he remained in Paris, he might be forced to agree to a power-sharing arrangement to his detriment or to his exclusion from power. So John the Fearless decided to return to his own territories, to regroup, and with his departure, the Burgundian position collapsed. Immediately after the Duke of Burgundy left Paris in September, he tried to open a line of communication with the Dauphin and Queen, and even requested that some of the moves made against him and his partisans be reversed. However, the Dauphin, still remembering John's role in the Cabochia uprising, was not inclined to grant these requests. When the Armagnacs began filing into Paris in October and saw the Dauphin's hostility towards John the Fearless, they felt empowered to take his place. Burgundian-aligned officials were dismissed and replaced with Armagnacs, and Burgundian policies were overturned. But the Armagnacs were going further than the Dauphin hoped. Throughout the past year, the prince had been hoping to escape from Burgundian control and rule France in a coalition which balanced royal, Armagnac, and Burgundian interests. This position was largely supported by men such as the Duke of Berry and many of the longer-serving members of the royal administration. However, this position was not supported by the Armagnac princes, who now took the reins of government. The Dauphin was quickly sidelined, and an uncompromising position with respect to the Duke of Burgundy was assumed. Messengers were sent to the Duke of Burgundy, demanding the extradition of certain Cabochia leaders who had fled to his territories, and that he remove his garrisons from a number of royal castles and forts. The Duke of Burgundy was steadily being excluded from the government of France, and many of his former partners were turning on him. The University of Paris, now largely led by Jean Gerson, repudiated the justification of Jean Petit, which defended the assassination of the Duke of Orléans, and even put it to the Council of Constance to determine whether or not it was heretical. More on that in a future episode. The Duke of Anjou repudiated the marriage of one of John's daughters to his son and heir, and returned her to Burgundy, an insult that John the Fearless would never forgive or forget. In this atmosphere, John the Fearless received letters from the Dauphin requesting that the Duke of Burgundy rescue him from the Armagnacs. It's not entirely clear whether these letters were genuine or not, and I've read accounts that take both positions. If the letters were fake, the Duke of Burgundy gained an easy justification for an armed return to Paris, but he also ran the risk of an even more serious breach with the royal government and Dauphin if he was found out. Furthermore, if the letters were fake, the Dauphin would have been annoyed that the Duke of Burgundy was trying to use him again, and probably would have moved more towards the Armagnac party. If the letters were genuine, the Dauphin must have been seriously threatened by the Armagnacs to recall the Duke of Burgundy so soon after he finally broke free from his control. This move would have also angered the Armagnacs, who currently controlled the government and had a preponderance of force in Paris. I usually tend to defer to Richard Vaughn, who argues here that the letters were most likely forgeries, but in this case I am more swayed by Richard Famiglietti's argument on their authenticity. Famiglietti points out that over the past two months, the Dauphin's power had been systematically limited, and thinks that accusations of his imprisonment, while exaggerated to a degree, had some truth, as he was shut in the Louvre and the Armagnacs controlled who came and went. He also points out that most people at the time accepted the authenticity of the letters unequivocally. Femiglietti argues that Louis of Guienne was betting that John's march on Paris would spook the Armagnacs into cooperating with him more, and that the Duke of Burgundy would not be able to take Paris or defeat the Armagnacs without royal aid, which would not be forthcoming. The Duke of Burgundy's initial response to the Dauphin's letter, or to his own forgery, was to confer with his allies in Antwerp. The Antwerp conference covered more than just the situation in Paris, and I'll circle back to it later on in the episode, but a significant amount of time was dedicated to what next steps should be taken. <laughs> 
and in the end, John the Fearless decided that he would once again march on Paris, something which has happened in most of our episodes over the past few months, and will happen a few more times. John the Fearless had been convinced by exiles from Paris and people fleeing from Armagnac reprisals that the people of Paris were unhappy and would open the gates to him without a fight. As the Duke of Burgundy began his march from the Low Countries to Paris, the Armagnac-dominated royal council met, where they denounced the Dauphin. Evidently, they believed that he had written the letters. The council also called for the remaining Burgundians in the Dauphin's household to be dismissed and arrested, including one Jean de Croix, who now languished in Orléanist captivity for a second time. Louis of Guienne, despite his anger at the Armagnacs, eventually came around and wrote a new letter to the Duke of Burgundy, cancelling his earlier summons, while not denying that he had written the earlier letters. His argument here was that he had never requested that the Duke of Burgundy come with an army, which was technically true, if not somewhat disingenuous, when the earlier letters were read between the lines. But the Duke of Burgundy was already on his way, and was not inclined to turn back. On his journey to the capital, he had been able to peacefully enter a number of towns and fortresses on the way by simply presenting his copies of the Dauphin's earlier letters, although this did not work everywhere. Many of the towns between John's territories and Paris simply did not know what was going on. On one hand, they had received royal orders not to admit the Duke of Burgundy, and some had even received similar letters from the Dauphin. But on the other hand, John the Fearless had handwritten letters from the prince requesting aid, as well as an army. On February the 7th, 1414, John the Fearless was camped in Saint-Denis with an army, while the Armagnacs were encamped in Paris, a mirror image of the situation in late 1411. However, while the Duke of Burgundy sent a herald to the royal council to justify his approach and present the letters, the council dismissed him out of hand. On his way out of the city, the herald was told by the Count of Armagnac that the next messenger sent into the city by John would lose his head. That same day, the royal council proclaimed John a rebel and a traitor, and also proclaimed a general summons to defend Paris from him. The day after that, the council made their case to the University of Paris, who agreed to support the judgment against the Duke of Burgundy. The Count of Armagnac was put in charge of the defense of the city, and with the University of Paris behind the Armagnacs, the next group to consider were the workers. John's army was not large enough to assault Paris, or even put it under a siege, and so the only way that he could gain entry into the city was if he was let in. The poorer areas of the capital soon became heavily policed by Armagnac sergeants. Known Burgundians were expelled from the city, and regular people could be fined or imprisoned on suspicion of Burgundian sympathies with even the flimsiest pretext. This heavy-handed approach was effective, as when the Duke of Burgundy approached the walls of Paris over the next few days, no one moved to let him in, and no pro-Burgundian demonstration took place. Finally, John the Fearless gave up. He had been unable to enter the city or force the Armagnacs into battle, and the only immediate gains from this march on Paris had been that the Duke of Burgundy was able to install a handful of Burgundian garrisons in Champagne. But these garrisons would not be the only consequence of the Duke of Burgundy's march on Paris. The Armagnacs had managed to call the arrière bon or general summons of the French military nobility, when John first began his march on Paris. And while those forces hadn't assembled soon enough to halt him, they now provided the Armagnacs with an opportunity for a counteroffensive. However, Preparations for this expedition were slow going, and it wasn't for about two months after John's withdrawal from Paris that the Armagnacs went on the attack. But once all the royalist Armagnac forces were assembled, they proved to be quite the threat. On April 1st, 1414, a mostly recovered King Charles summoned the Oriflamme from the Abbey of Saint-Denis, and a few days later set off with a large army of 25,000 men. This army wasn't an entirely partisan force. John had alienated many neutral princes through his support of the Cabochiat, and so with the Dauphin and King on side with the Armagnacs, many princes who had avoided choosing sides thus far responded to the arrière ball. But the dominating presence in the army was indeed Armagnac. The King and Dauphin even marched under the banner of the Count of Armagnac rather than the royal banner, symbolism which vexed many of the neutral lords. Furthermore, 
the army was dominated by the Armagnac princes, such as the Count of Armagnac himself, the Dukes of Anjou, Berry, Bourbon, and Orléans, the Counts of Alençon, Vertu, and Richemont, and the Lord of Aubray. Additionally, enthusiasm for this expedition was lacking from the neutral lords, who viewed the expedition, rightly, as pursuing a private vendetta with public resources. As for the enthusiasm of the royal family, that point is harder to track. King Charles had of course approved of the royal council's pronouncement against John the Fearless, as well as the Ariabon, and had summoned the Oriflamme. But his mental state, while outwardly recovered, was still weak, and he was easily manipulated, and didn't seem to share the same drive for revenge that the Armagnacs did. Meanwhile, the Dauphin has been described as both the mastermind of the expedition and as a reluctant follower. My personal opinion tends to land in the middle. Louis of Guienne definitely didn't mind seeing his father-in-law brought down a peg or two, but likely knew that the success of this expedition would further entrench Armagnac dominance of the court and further weaken his own position. And with the king giving the outward appearance of health and support for the mission, he really couldn't do much to stop it. While the Armagnacs were preparing to depart, John the Fearless was making his own preparations for the defense of his lands. He had left a handful of garrisons in Picardy and Champagne, with the two most significant in the towns of Compiègne and Soissons. The Duke of Burgundy also met with the four members of Flanders in an attempt to raise their militias, but this was unsuccessful as the Flemings refused to join an army fighting one led by the king. John got further when he requested an aid from them, but the members here saw an opportunity to wring privileges out of their count in exchange for money. However, the privileges that the Flemings requested went too far for the duke, and the members were unwilling to concede on any of them. So in the end, negotiations broke down, and both parties left empty-handed. The Duke of Burgundy did not only look to the Flemings, but, like with the Flemings, many of John's other vassals hesitated to join the army. The Count of Saint-Paul allegedly broke his leg, while the Burgundian Admiral of France faked an outbreak of gout. Both of these men had received summons from the king and the Duke of Burgundy, and both decided that they would be best served by sitting the coming conflict out. This is not to say that John was abandoned by all his vassals. He still managed to raise a considerable force from his lands, especially from the county of Burgundy, which as part of the Holy Roman Empire did not face the same conflict of loyalty to the crown of France. But in the end, his army numbered about a third the size of the Royal Armagnac Force. The first stop of the Armagnac army was Compiègne. The garrison proclaimed their loyalty to both the king and the Duke of Burgundy, and further argued that the king was not in control of the army, which was probably not far from the truth. But when John did not come to relieve the town, the Burgundian garrison surrendered after a short siege. The Count of Armagnac wanted to make a bloody example of the garrison, but the more moderate princes pushed for leniency. The army's next stop was Soissons. The Burgundian captain of the garrison of Soissons claimed that he would open the gates of the town for the king, but not for the army of the Duke of Orléans. However, not long after the Armagnacs arrived, the city was betrayed to them by a disgruntled noble, and Soissons was sacked. The Count of Armagnac then had many of the captured Burgundians executed, and so gained his example. After Soissons, things looked dire for the Duke of Burgundy. In fact, things looked so bad that a few days after the town fell, Philip of Burgundy submitted to the king. Philip, who ruled Nevers, Rethel, and the Burgundian Champagne lands, was in a far less secure defensive position than his brothers, and thought that if he didn't submit now, his lands would be overrun. Philip agreed not to aid his brother anymore and to surrender his territories to the crown. For this act of obedience, Charles granted Philip's lands back to him. Philip had thus managed to come out of the conflict fairly unscathed, but John lost a key ally and an able commander. While Philip's submission was a blow against the Duke of Burgundy, after leaving Soissons, the Armagnac royal army began to lose its momentum. They soon reached the town of Saint-Caton, near the border of Artois. The army spent about a month in Saint-Caton without accomplishing much of note before the decision was made to enter the county of Artois and march on Arras. 
John the Fearless knew that he didn't have the numbers to oppose the Armagnac army in open battle, and so decided to garrison a number of fortresses between Saint-Caton and Arras to slow down the Armagnac advance and harry them. The month the Armagnac spent in Saint-Caton gave the Duke of Burgundy ample time to dig in, and while the Duke of Burgundy was making preparations to defend his lands, he was also sending delegations in an attempt to make peace. These delegations were led by his brother, Anthony, the Duke of Brabant, and his sister, Margaret, the Countess of Hainaut, Holland, and Zealand, and mother-in-law of the second oldest son of the king. But at this point, these talks came to nothing, as the Armagnac still dominated the political will of the army, and refused to compromise with the Duke of Burgundy. It wasn't until late July that the Armagnac army arrived at Arras, and at Arras the two sides dug in. The Armagnac force vastly outnumbered the Burgundians, so no battle outside the walls was expected, but it was still not enough to completely besiege Arras. Therefore, the best hope of the Armagnacs was that the city would surrender to the king as the other towns had done thus far. However, Arras was a different beast with strong fortifications. An artillery duel between the attackers and defenders soon began, but not much other action took place. This siege, and really the whole campaign, reminds me of the Duke of Burgundy's 1412 Siege of Bourges, which I covered in episode 26. These two campaigns were essentially mirror images of each other. One side had control of the king and Dauphin, and launched a campaign to punish the other. The royal support made it hard for the other side to summon an army and keep their fortresses, as the defenders of those fortresses didn't want to oppose the king. And, when the defenders did hold out, they claimed that they were not opposed to the king, but to whichever side was truly in control. Still, many fortresses and towns fell under the might of a combined royal partisan army, until that army reached a large town with strong defenses. That town could not be effectively besieged, and so an ineffective siege marked with artillery duels soon began, while the moderates in the royal army tried to negotiate a peace to the dismay of the hardcore partisans. So let's get to those negotiations. Once again, Anthony and Margaret of Burgundy led John's delegation, while the Armagnacs did their best to hamper the proceedings. I won't go into too much detail, as essentially, the grievances between the Armagnacs and Burgundians were the same as they had been for years. It's just that now the Armagnacs were dominant. Initially, the Armagnacs demanded that before any peace could be negotiated, the Duke of Burgundy would have to submit to the king for his treasonous acts, including the murder of the Duke of Orléans and his conduct in the Civil War. On the other hand, John refused to admit to any wrongdoing, and going even further, demanded pardons for the Cabochiens who were sheltering in his territory, and that the Burgundian royal officials who had been dismissed by the Armagnacs be restored to their offices. Unsurprisingly, with both sides taking such an uncompromising position, the negotiations did not accomplish much. But as the siege dragged on, both sides began to desire peace more. So a few weeks later, Anthony and Margaret returned to open negotiations once again. This round of negotiations proved more fruitful. Like at Bourges, the Dauphin was one of the principal instigators of peace. King Charles was still mostly present, but the siege had taken a toll on his mental state, causing the Dauphin to assume more responsibilities. The Dauphin wanted peace for a number of reasons, and it's hard to gauge just how much he even wanted the campaign in the first place. Like at Bourges, dysentery had broken out in the besieger camp, and the cost of the campaign was really stretching the finances of the French state. A tie had been levied to pay for it, and that money was quickly running out. Furthermore, the new King of England, Henry V, was threatening an invasion of France, and was also currently in negotiations with the Duke of Burgundy. If John the Fearless could be brought on side as an English ally, there was a good chance that France might collapse under the weight of an Anglo-Burgundian alliance. Meanwhile, on the Burgundian side, the Duke had also run out of money, and was faced with the fact that many of his allies were more eager for peace than he was, including his brother Anthony. Moreover, while the Duke of Burgundy wanted to defeat the Armagnacs, Henry V was insisting on Burgundian aid against a fully royal army, something which John was not prepared to give. So, just as had happened many times in the past few years, 
a compromise was reached that didn't really address any of the underlying issues. Man, how many times have I said that in the past few episodes? According to the Treaty of Arras, the Duke of Burgundy was to hand Arras over to the king, although this was to be a purely formal gesture, and it was to be handed back after a week of occupation without being sacked. And the royal fortresses garrisoned by Burgundians were to be actually handed over to the king. John would expel the Cabo Xiao rebels he harbored from his lands, but in exchange, many of them would be pardoned. How many, though, was to be negotiated at a later point? The Duke of Burgundy was also to promise that he would make no alliance with the English, and he was forbidden from coming to Paris without a summons from either the king or Dauphin. And finally, the Peace of Chartres was to be reiterated. Now, the Peace of Arras could not be considered a win for John the Fearless, but it also wasn't a complete undoing. The Duke of Burgundy was now officially expelled from the government of France, but he had managed to keep the Armagnacs at bay, and had kept his unyielding position with respect to the murder of Louis of Orléans and his actions during the Civil War. However, the Duke of Burgundy only agreed to this peace because he was confident that he could wring more concessions out of the government during the subsequent negotiations around the pardons of the Cabo Chien. These terms really annoyed the Armagnacs, and in fact, many refused to swear to this peace until they were personally ordered to do so by the Dauphin. And so, the Armagnacs returned to Paris, grumbling all the way. Once more, the Dauphin had forced a peace, but he had not driven the dominant party from power, and was thus faced with a different conflict once back in the capital. But for now, we'll leave the Dauphin to deal with the Armagnacs as he gets ready to continue negotiating with the Burgundians, and take a look at what's been happening in John's territories. As the Civil War has ramped up, I've left things in the provinces unattended to, so there are a few things that I want to explore in Flanders and the two Burgundies. Since 1411, John's son and heir Philip had been acting as his father's agent in Flanders. The Count of Charolais would be stationed in Flanders for the remainder of his father's reign, and in that time he learned to work with the Commodal Consul in Ghent, the members of Flanders, and the other powerful interests in the county. Philip's constant presence in Flanders was a key contributor to the relative stability that the county experienced during John's reign, but it was not the only one. The Duke of Burgundy and the Count of Charolais enhanced their goodwill by repeatedly supporting the commercial interests of Flanders. They were quick to confirm the privileges of important foreign merchants and took an active role in trade negotiations and disputes with other powers. One example of this is especially interesting as it gives us an example of a conflict between John and his brother Anthony, who so far we've seen acting as one of his chief supporters. The basis of this conflict was a dispute between the town of Mechelen, which was a Flemish enclave within Brabant, and the Brabantine town of Antwerp. This dispute was mostly based on competition for trade and monopoly privileges, and the rivalry between the towns predated the Burgundian presence in the Low Countries. It escalated in the late 1400s and early 1410s through a series of back-and-forth attacks on shipping, which ended up straining the relationship between John and Anthony. The Duke of Burgundy ordered his brother to make Antwerp back down, to which the Duke of Brabant responded, quote, My lord and brother, I recognize that you are my elder brother, and, so long as you do not interfere with me in my own jurisdiction, I shall take care to fulfill promptly whatever service of friendship I owe you because of your primogeniture. However, as Duke of Brabant, I am not prepared to allow you, as Count of Flanders, to encroach on my frontiers, in the conservation of which you, more than anyone else, are bound to assist me with aid, counsel, and goodwill. The Duke of Burgundy then ordered a blockade on Antwerp, and it wasn't until December of 1413, in the conference at Antwerp that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, that Anthony and John resolved their dispute. However, the extent to which the dispute was resolved from the town's point of view is debatable, as both made appeals to Sigismund of Luxembourg, now King of Germany, the next year. But, despite the goodwill that John and Philip had earned in Flanders, they did face occasional rumblings of discontent. In September of 1411, shortly after Philip took up his role in Flanders, and in the immediate aftermath of the Flemish militia's retreat from Montdidier, which I covered in episode 26, 
The Bruges militia refused to disband and presented the pro-Burgundian magistrates of the town with a list of several demands. These demands boiled down to the abolition of a few taxes and the restoration of certain privileges, and notably included the revocation of the Kaufvel, or the ban on summoning the militias without comital consent, and the seventh penny tax that John had forced on Bruges in 1407, which I covered in episode 21. The Burgundian-aligned officials in Bruges tried to negotiate with the militia to get them to accept a compromise, but the militiamen were unwilling to yield on any of the points. Eventually, Philip was brought in to negotiate with the Bourgeois, but the Count of Charolais was only able to reach a slight compromise with the Bruges militia to secure the seventh penny, and eventually just gave in on all the other points. The demanded privileges were granted, and the taxes, apart from the seventh penny, were revoked, while Philip lodged an official complaint stating that he had acted under duress. The militia was jubilant, and when they received the actual parchment of the Kaufvel, tore it into pieces in a public ceremony. To help restore order, Philip then dismissed the two comital officials that the Bruges militia had been most openly opposed to. For the rest of John's reign, Bruges remained largely at peace, although the Duke of Burgundy had to accept that he no longer had as much influence in the city. But as John the Fearless had other issues to deal with, he was content to loosen his grasp on Bruges. And, as he had not technically approved the deal that Philip had made, he did not have to swallow his pride. As John the Fearless wrote to his son in the aftermath of the event, quote, What is done by you will be less damaging to my honor. The other significant episode of friction between the Burgundians and Flanders occurred while John was facing the Armagnac invasion that we covered in the beginning of this episode. So I won't rehash what I said about 15 minutes ago. We saw that in the negotiations for first soldiers and then money, that the four members wanted to roll back many of the measures of centralization that John had managed to establish in the first few years of his reign, but neither side wanted to compromise. But we shouldn't take this failure of cooperation as a sign that John was unpopular in Flanders, or that the Flemings were considering coming to terms with the Armagnacs. The Flemings saw that the Burgundians were willing to look out for their commercial interests, and so were willing to support their duke. They just wanted to limit his power over them. Delegates from the four members took part in the negotiations around the Treaty of Arras, and despite attempts from the Armagnacs, never wavered in their support of John the Fearless. As John's reign continued, he did manage to secure more aids from the members of Flanders, and was willing to continue negotiating over their privileges. The Duke of Burgundy never went back on his word during these negotiations, and, in doing so, did earn some goodwill from his Flemish subjects, even if they did sometimes chafe under his attempts at centralization. There were other, more minor conflicts between John and Philip and the towns of Flanders in the second half of John's reign, but the large Flemish revolts that took place throughout the 1300s were noticeably absent. But while Flanders was generally at peace in these years, the two Burgundies were more under threat. Just as the Count of Charolais acted as his father's representative in Flanders, the Duchess of Burgundy acted in John's name in Burgundy itself. And in 1414, Burgundy was under threat on two fronts. The first of these has been covered a few times and was the County of Tonnerre. Louis de Chalon had never accepted his loss of Tonnerre in 1411, and so, when the Armagnacs advanced against John the Fearless in Artois in 1414, the Count of Tonnerre decided to launch another expedition against the Duchy of Burgundy. Like in 1411, Margaret of Bavaria quickly organized a defense of the duchy, and while Tonnerre quickly fell to Louis de Chalon, he was unable to do much else apart from sending the occasional raid into Burgundy proper. The fortifications built by Philip the Bold, John the Fearless, and Margaret of Bavaria did their job, and the raids were always fought off by a Burgundian army. When the Peace of Arras was signed, a company of Burgundian soldiers, whose absence from the duchy contributed to Chalon's decision to attack it, managed to retake the castle of Tonnerre, as well as the rest of the county, on their way back. For the rest of his life, John the Fearless would administer the county of Tonnerre, while Louis de Chalon would remain an inveterate but exiled Armagnac partisan. The other threat to Burgundy came from the Duke of Bourbon. Back in 1412, Margaret had overseen the seizure of the town of Chateau Chinon, which was owned by the Duke of Bourbon, but wedged between the County of Nevers and the Duchy of Burgundy. 
Chateau Chinon's garrison held out for a few months, but as the Duke of Bourbon was otherwise occupied in Bourges at the time, no further aid was going to reach the town, and they eventually surrendered. But Chateau Chinon was not the only Bourbon territory bordering Burgundy. To the south of the duchy was the region of Beaujolais. In 1412, a pro-Burgundian expedition to Beaujolais was launched, but that was unsuccessful, and so the region remained a potential threat until 1414. In 1414, John the Fearless and John Duke of Bourbon signed a limited treaty of non-aggression, where neither would attack the other's territories, and if war between the two was declared, a three weeks notice would have to be given before an attack could begin. So, by a combination of conquest and diplomacy, the borders of the Duchy of Burgundy were protected. While Philip of Navarre's defection from the Burgundian cause in 1414 did represent a potential risk on the Duchy's western front, Philip's defection was defensive in nature as his lands were under a much more direct threat than either of his brothers, and never would march against John. And speaking of John's siblings, at the beginning of 1415, Anthony and Margaret of Burgundy were preparing to meet with the Dauphin at Saint-Lee to finalize the peace deal between the Duke of Burgundy and Paris. Since the Peace of Arras had first been arranged, the situation in Paris had changed. The Dauphin had managed to forge an alliance with the Duke of Berry, Arthur de Richemont, Constable Charles d'Albret, and a few others less committed to the Armagnac cause, and fled to Queen Isabeau's stronghold at Milan where he worked to dismiss many Armagnacs from his household and the royal government, and replace them with men loyal to him, and without strong connections to either the Armagnacs or Burgundians. Louis of Guienne also managed to secure the support of the Count of Alençon by making him the Duke of Alençon. The Dauphin then returned to Paris and assumed control of the government in his father's name. But the loss of influence of the Armagnacs did not mean that the Dauphin was going to welcome John back to court with open arms. In a worrying sign for John's future with the Dauphin, Louis of Guienne sent his wife, Margaret of Burgundy, away and ostentatiously took up a lover. As the Dauphin had managed to outmaneuver the Armagnacs in Paris on his own, he no longer needed the Burgundians as a counterweight against them. But benefiting John the Fearless was the threat of an English invasion where Burgundian aid on either side could be decisive. More on that in the next episode. Shortly before the conference was set to begin, the Dauphin decided to try negotiation tactic number six and change the location at the last minute. Now, rather than saint lee well outside of the capital, the conference was now going to take place at Saint-Denis, right outside of it. And because of this, the older Margaret of Burgundy was no longer able to participate, so John would only be represented by his brother and a delegation from the members of Flanders. When negotiations opened in February of 1415, the Duke of Burgundy's representatives were focused on two main issues, a general reconciliation for the nobility and a pardon for the Cabochia rebels taking refuge in John's territories. Some compromises were made, but the Dauphin was firm on maintaining exemptions to the general pardon. Louis of Guienne did note that he was willing to provide individual pardons for some of the exempted people, but the Burgundians could get no further than that. By mid-March, the Burgundian envoys were willing to ratify a new version of the peace. This was in part at the urging of Anthony of Burgundy himself, as he was more eager than his brother to reconcile with the rest of the court. John the Fearless, who still took his uncompromising stance on the Civil War, was unhappy with the deal that his brother secured, but he saw no point in reopening hostilities and figured that he could always renegotiate later. And in fact, John's position was about to get much stronger, as news from across the English Channel did not bode well for peace in France. Henry V had been in negotiations with Paris, the Armagnacs, and the Burgundians throughout the past two years. And throughout all of them, it had been clear that the young English king was itching for war. Now in the spring of 1415, Henry's preparations were being noticed in Paris and in Burgundy, and an English invasion looked like it was in the cards. So next time, which will be in four weeks rather than two, we'll go back and cover those negotiations as we travel down the road to Agincourt. Thank you so much to my patrons. Uldis, Duc de Chimay, Christine, Comte de Chenonceau, Elliot, Kraft von Kravenstein, Anthony, Comte de Chateauneuf-Nuxois, James, Kraft von Temsa, Preston, 
Comte de Saint Fargo, Nicholas, Comte de Comari, Marc, Comte de Merceau, Diana, Graf von Biersel, Mehmet, Comte Santerre, Chris, Comte de Simur, David, Graf von Bornem, and to my Knights of the Duchy. If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash Burgundy. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can do so by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice and telling your friends about the show. Both really help to grow the show and will earn you my everlasting appreciation. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at Valois Burgundy on Twitter or Blue Sky, or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you for listening.